Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Patrick McCullough. I am, uh, I have pre recorded this for the meeting. Sorry I could not be with you today. Uh, I'm recording this on Friday, uh, November 10th. And uh, this presentation is going to cover uh, wheat control topics in turf grass management. We're going to review the basics and also uh, get some recent updates on. Uh, some current trends and some new products that are coming out in the uh, turf grass industry for uh, pre and post emergent weed control. Just to start off, uh, going over some of the basics here. Um, books for weed identification are very important uh, for turf grass managers to have. Uh, we recommend uh, two specific books for turf grass managers to have. Uh, to help identify weeds in their turf. Uh, one is the Color Atlas of Turf Grass Weeds. This is a hardback book published by the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. The other is Weeds of Southern Turf Grass. Uh, this is a uh, UGA uh, publication that you can uh, get through the Athens Bookstore. Uh, both of these books are available online. Uh, you can buy them uh, through the Amazon site, eBay, and uh, various other online vendors. But uh, weed identification is very critical. We need to uh, first uh, identify the weed species uh, before we can select appropriate control options. And having a, a good book to reference uh, can help you uh, key out a weed species uh, as you uh, see new species emerging in your turf. Weed identification books are typically broken down into two main categories. Uh, the first is grassy weeds uh, versus broadleaf weeds. Uh, weeds are typically classified uh, uh, as either grasses or broadleaf weeds, monocots or dicots. There's also a third category that we often find in uh, weed identification books, sort of a miscellaneous uh, weed species section, and this is grass-like weeds. This includes everything from uh, sedges, uh, wild garlic, wild onion, uh, plants like Star of Bethlehem. Uh, these, these plants typically don't fall under the category of grasses or broadleaf weeds, uh, but they are uh, in that third category of grass-like weeds. Some of the key characteristics that can help you identify weed species, uh, starting with seed heads. Uh, this is usually the first characteristic that I look for on a weed sample when we are trying to identify the species. Most grassy plants have a very distinct seed head that is indicative of a certain species. Uh, you can see here on this slide where we've got uh, various seed heads on the top left there. That is Dallas grass, where it's a, a group of alternating spikes uh, on the uh, seed head structure. The bottom left, you can see uh, crowfoot grass, where the spikes uh, join together at the uh, main point at the end of the uh, seed head uh, stem there. So uh, these are all uh, very good characteristics that can help you uh, quickly identify a, a weed species. Um, typically in turf grass, we don't always have seed heads present, especially during the growing season when we're, when we're constantly mowing off uh, shoot growth and the seed head uh, formation. But uh, this is typically uh, the uh, best characteristic to quickly key out a weed species that you may have in your turf. Here's a good example looking at two past palum species here. You can see they have a, a very similar uh, seed head spike. Uh, there between the hay grass and uh, Dallas grass. These are two warm season perennial uh, weedy species that have very different um, selective control options. We can get uh, very good control of the grass using herbicides like metsulfuron and uh, various warm season species, whereas Dallas grass, we need to have a uh, uh, very uh, specific application programs in uh, certain turf grass species. Uh, so getting the identification of those species uh, keyed out can be critical. You can see Bahia grass has uh, a V-shaped seed head where the spikes join um, at the uh, base of the seed head versus Dallas grass that again has the alternating spike. So uh, if you don't have that seed head structure present, it may be difficult to key out those two weed species uh, in your turf. So a good example there where seed heads can help you identify uh, the species of the weed. 
Here's a look at the Poa annua seed head. We're going to start seeing a lot, a lot more of this here in the winter and the springtime. Uh, the panicle inflorescence, where it is, uh, it's got multiple branches, uh, and this is also a uh, great characteristic to determine uh, Poa annua versus some of the other grassy weeds we may have present in turf. Grassy weeds also have a uh, very distinct uh, structure on the base of the uh, leaf blade called ligules. This is a structure that uh, is, is found at the base of the leaf uh, where it joins the stem. Uh, grassy weeds have uh, typically a very distinct ligule that can help you determine the species if you do not have a seed head present. Ligules can be tall, fleshy, white structures. They can be smooth uh, there on the margins. Uh, some weeds like barnyard grass on the top right of this slide uh, do not have a distinct ligule where uh, that structure is absent uh, from the plant. So uh, if you do not see a ligule, uh, very good chance it could be barnyard grass in the summertime versus crabgrass that has a very similar appearance but has a fleshy ligule uh, often with a fringe of hairs uh, there at the base of the leaf. So ligules are distinct structures uh, on grassy plants only, broadleaf weeds and sedges. Uh, we are not looking for uh, ligules at the uh, base of the leaf, but good characteristic to uh, help identify grassy weed species. Broadleaf weeds often have distinct flowers. Uh, they can have uh, colorful showy flowers like you see there on the top left with uh, weeds like oxalis. Other weeds like henbit, purple dead nettle, uh, can have uh, very small uh, flowers uh, but can be very colorful, pink to purplish uh, in color uh, as the plant matures. Um, we can also use flowers to determine one uh, species from another based on the uh, color of the uh, petals on the flower. Good example here are the two day flowers where uh, the species on the left has two blue petals and one white petal uh, versus spreading day flower on the right that's got three blue petals. So good examples there where flowers can uh, help you determine uh, the species on a broadleaf weed and uh, the uh, colors and the uh, size of the flower also can uh, be a good characteristic to help you identify uh, a, uh, a broadleaf weed in your turf grass. Broadleaf weeds, we can also take a look at how the leaves are arranged on the stems. Uh, some broadleaf weeds can have uh, sort of the alternate arrangement of leaves uh, there on the stem. Uh, some can also have the opposite arrangement uh, where the leaves sort of join together at the uh, base of the stem of the plant. Uh, so uh, something else to consider as you are trying to key out weed species is how is, are, are the leaves arranged uh, on the stem of the plant. Some weeds have uh, dense uh, hairs all over the uh, leaves and the stems like you see there on the left with sticky chickweed. Uh, and then some plants have uh, a few hairs or are smooth. Uh, like you see with common chickweed on the right. Uh, common chickweed typically has uh, soft hairs on the margin of the leaf versus sticky chickweed, which is uh, generally covered with hairs uh, on the leaves and stems. Another good example where uh, you can take a look at the hairs on the plant to help key out a, a grassy weed would be crabgrass. Um, we have uh, various crabgrass species uh, that are found in turf grass in Georgia. Smooth crabgrass gets its name because it is hairless. Uh, large crabgrass is covered with hairs all over the stems and all over the leaves. And then southern crabgrass uh, typically has hairy stems, uh, hairy uh, stolons, and uh, has smooth leaves. So another good example where the, the hairs on the plant can help you identify the species of the weed. And then of course, leaf markings, other characteristics uh, to key out broadleaf weeds, uh, white clover on the left with the uh, white markings on the base of the leaf versus spotted burr clover on the right uh, that has the purplish uh, dot there in the center of the leaf. Uh, this is important because we're looking at two different uh, clover species that uh, one is a cool season perennial white clover uh, versus the winter annual uh, spotted burr clover there. So. Uh, looking at characteristics, identifying the plant can help you determine uh, when those weeds will emerge, how they're going to grow, 
and uh, how we can plan weed control programs around their uh, life cycle. Right now, we're seeing many uh, winter annual weeds begin to germinate. We're already seeing uh, species like henbit, uh, weeds like annual bluegrass, bittercress, and hop clovers. These are true winter annual weeds that are germinating in the fall. They are uh, starting to um, grow actively in landscapes and in turf grass. These plants go to seed in the springtime and then they will complete their life cycle and then die out in the summertime. Um, and this is a good example of the annual uh, life cycle that these weeds will grow for one year uh, and then go to seed and then die out. The advantage of this life cycle is that uh, it is predictable. We know when annual bluegrass begins to germinate in turf grasses, we know when crabgrass begins to germinate in the late winter and springtime, and therefore we can plan uh, management programs around when these weeds begin to emerge uh, in turf grass. And we can apply pre-emergent herbicides to prevent their establishment uh, based on when these uh, weeds begin to germinate uh, in the soil. Summer annual weeds include uh, species like goosegrass, uh, crabgrass, uh, foxtail, sandbur. Some of the broadleaf weeds that are true summer annuals include uh, species like spotted spurge, uh, doveweed, um, purslane. These are all weeds that germinate in the springtime. Uh, they resume active growth throughout the summertime. They go to seed in the fall and then they transition out and die out in the winter time so they complete their life cycle during the uh, warm season of the year perennial weeds are much more difficult to control in turf grass than the annuals uh, because these plants can uh, uh, germinate from seed but they can also regrow from uh, tap roots and uh, below ground plant parts uh, stolons rhizomes tubers uh, simple perennials uh, can primarily reproduce by seed. We can partially control these plants by hand pulling and digging them out of the ground. Uh, Pre-emergent herbicides can be effective, but uh, they often provide erratic levels of control because these plants can also emerge from below ground vegetative structures. So perennials are uh, less predictable on uh, their establishment and their growth. Uh, and they are much more difficult to control than the annual uh, weeds that we have in uh, turf grass. Good example of a simple perennial that is starting to emerge in turf in the fall. Uh, weeds like wild garlic, wild onion, uh, they are emerging from not only seed, uh, but they are also starting to establish from below ground bulbs that stay uh, dormant during the summertime. Uh, as temperatures cool down, uh, these plants will then begin to reemerge and wild garlic can be a uh, very troublesome weed in dormant turf grasses uh, during the winter time. So uh, typically pre-emergent herbicides do not control plants that are emerging from below ground vegetative structures, uh, such as below ground bulbs, uh, like we see with wild garlic. Complex perennials are uh, the most difficult weeds to control in turf grass because uh, they are going to survive multiple years. Uh, they primarily reproduce and spread uh, through asexual reproduction, which includes uh, stolons, rhizomes, uh, tubers, uh, such as with the sedges. Uh, these weeds include species such as white clover, Canada thistle, ground ivy, Bermuda grass, uh, yellow nut sedge, purple nut sedge. These are all perennial weeds uh, that are going to survive multiple years uh, in our uh, lawns and landscapes. Uh, management implications here, uh, we can hand pull and dig some of these plants out of the ground, but it's often not a long-term control strategy. Because these plants can spread laterally, because they can produce runners, uh, those plants can then uh, create daughter plants and trying to dig those plants out of the ground, we often leave behind some of the stems and stolons that are present in the turf. And um, when they're growing in patches, uh, sometimes the uh, best way to uh, control these species, especially in uh, turf, is to come in with non-selective options such as Roundup and uh, just treating the patch and then treating the area around the patch uh, to ensure that you're getting all the surrounding uh, stems and stolons that uh, may have uh, been created from that uh, uh, main patch of the weed. 
good example here of a complex perennial is um, uh, Bermuda grass. This, of course, is a major warm season turf grass species, but if you had Bermuda growing in the middle of centipede grass, soja, or fescue, uh, or you know various other uh, turf species, it can be a long-term uh, invasive weed species that can, can be very competitive with other turf species. And if it's not controlled early, Bermuda grass is going to spread from lateral stems and it will uh, you know, eventually have significant competition that uh, can lead to the, the uh, need to renovate a lawn because uh, selective control of Bermuda grass is uh, very difficult in uh, many warm and cool season turf grass species. So it's important to uh, routinely scout your turf, um, you know, identify weeds that may warrant control, but also note uh, new weed species that may be present. Early detection is very critical, especially with perennial weeds. We want to get on top of these uh, species as soon as possible, uh, get them removed, hand pull them out, uh, treat herbicides if needed, and prevent their spread of these uh, populations because uh, most of the time, if a perennial weed is left uncontrolled, it's going to, uh, over time, spread, reproduce, and create a long-term problem for us. So detecting these weeds early on can be very critical. A uh, good example would be something like purple nuts edge, where if you have a few small plants, uh, it's important to uh, get those controlled, get them removed, because there will be significant reproduction below ground with tuber chains. Uh, and that weed will continue to spread and uh, be uh, a, a very severe infestation over time if it's uh, left uncontrolled. Uh, also, as you are uh, identifying new weed species present, it's important to evaluate turf grass cultural practices that may need to be adjusted. Uh, oftentimes, that when we see weeds that are starting to emerge or new weed species, they are taking advantage of the lack of competition from uh, turf grass growth. And if we can make adjustments in mowing programs, fertility, uh, modifying how much we irrigate, uh, this all can enhance turf grass competition to uh, reduce the overall uh, spread and the population of weeds present uh, in our turf grass. Good example of a cultural practice that will influence the uh, population of a weed species in a lawn is mowing height on crabgrass. This is very important in tall fescue, where uh, during the summertime, tall fescue typically declines due to summer stress, and uh, crabgrass becomes very competitive. But making a simple adjustment in the height of cut of a tall fescue lawn can significantly increase the uh, competition of uh, tall fescue uh, with crabgrass in the summertime. So this is a look at a study that was conducted in um, North Carolina, where they looked at four different mowing heights of tall fescue on the percent cover of crabgrass uh, in that lawn. And as you can see, when they raised the mowing height from one to four inches, they cut uh, the crabgrass population down from 95% cover to basically 0%. So as they increased uh, the height of tall fescue, it became more competitive. It was able to shade out uh, crabgrass, and uh, they were able to basically prevent the emergence of crabgrass because the fescue was so competitive. So mowing height and mowing frequency can be very critical. This will affect the competitive growth of turf grasses and can uh, help cut down on weed populations and uh, which over time can of course help cut down on the need to apply herbicides and uh, various other management inputs. So depending on the species that you're managing, uh, there is an appropriate uh, mower and height of cut and mowing frequency. Uh, to prevent scalping. So uh, typically we want to, re to remove no more than one third of the total leaf area with the mowing. Uh, and, uh, th uh, and based on the turf species, that could be every five to seven days, uh, five to 10 days for uh, grass like centipede that uh, doesn't grow uh, quite as quickly as some of the other warm season grasses. So something to consider is just make sure you are mowing at the appropriate height and the appropriate frequency uh, during active growth, and uh, this will just help promote the recovery of a uh, uh, lawn from a mowing operation and uh, should help with uh, promoting competition with weed species uh, in your turf. 
Weed populations are influenced by irrigation, how much we water, how frequently. Uh, typically, uh, weed species uh, thrive in areas that remain wet for extended periods of time. A uh, good example there uh, is uh, weeds like uh, dollar weed. Uh, this is a uh, slide that shows the effects of uh, watering programs, either daily, conditionally, or as uh, or uh, when the grass showed severe wilt on the x-axis there on percent dollar weed cover. And this was a three-year field study in Florida. And you can see there where they watered every single day, uh, they had about a five to six uh, fold increase in dollar weed cover compared to when they watered as the grass uh, needed it. So uh, how much we water will certainly influence the uh, pressure and the growth of weeds uh, like sedges, which thrive in wet soils. Uh, white clover likes to have wet feet as well. So uh, poorly drained, uh, high irrigation uh, uh, programs will certainly favor and encourage the growth of uh, those types of weeds uh, in our turf. Uh, for uh, weeds in the wintertime, uh, Poa annua uh, likes also to have uh, wet soils. It's going to thrive in poorly drained areas. Uh, so making modifications in uh, the frequency of the watering program, improving drainage, uh, and uh, also uh, trying to relieve compaction. Uh, trying to uh, promote the health of the grass by uh, 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 core aerification and uh, minimizing compaction can also help reduce weed populations uh, in your turf grass as well. Here's a picture of a tall fescue lawn that has a significant infestation of broadleaf dock. And uh, you would think that looking at this picture, there's a major problem with this weed species uh, in this area. However, as we pull back from this picture, you can see that only that center plot, that center rectangle, has broadleaf dock present, uh, whereas all the other rectangles of uh, different tall fescue cultivars uh, are uh, weed free. And this is a picture of a tall fescue NTEP trial where that specific seed lot that they seeded uh, had uh, seed lot contamination with broadleaf dock. So they brought that. Uh, weed seed in when they planted uh, that particular plot. And this is just a great example of the importance of planting uh, high quality certified seed uh, so that we're not bringing in new weed species when we plant. And um, this, is, uh, this is a look at uh, a uh, fescue uh, lawn there where uh, they, they, they bought basically the uh, low quality seed, and this, this can be an issue with uh, a lot of the cheap seed that is uh, sold in the big box retailers uh, that may have noxious weeds uh, present or uh, unwanted species such as ryegrass or carpet grass present uh, in the uh, seed bag. So just taking a look at the percent seed, what's in the bag that you're purchasing, and uh, just make sure that you are uh, making a good investment when you are planting uh, turf grasses, not only from seed, but sod as well. Uh, looking at the uh, sod before you purchase it, uh, you know, making sure that there's uh, no weeds present can uh, certainly be important. So you're not bringing in uh, weeds when you're planting a uh, new field or a new lawn. Pre-emergent herbicides are some of the most important tools that we have to prevent the establishment of uh, weed species in turf grass. Pre-emergent herbicides are applied uh, prior to weed seed germination. So we need to get these herbicides out in high enough concentration uh, before we see the emergence of uh, uh, winter and summer annual weeds. Uh, Pre-emergent herbicides are applied to the soil. They are tightly bound to the upper half inch or so of the soil profile. Uh, and they are not uh, readily mobile in the soil. So they are bound and uh, they typically stay put uh, well, once they finally uh, bind uh, to the soil. Uh, Pre-emergent herbicides are concentrated in the upper layer uh, of the soil profile, which is important because that is where the weed seed bank is uh, in the soil. Uh, weeds are going to germinate, and the young roots and shoots will absorb that pre-emergent herbicide out of the soil. Uh, it will then absorb that product uh, uh, 
through the uh, soil water solution. And uh, most pre-emergent herbicides are going into tie up cell division. So weed seedlings that germinate first, uh, take in the herbicide, will fail to establish a healthy root system and they will die out. Um, Pre-emergent herbicides do not prevent weed seed germination. So the weeds must first germinate uh, they must take in the herbicide through the roots and shoots, and that is how we control weeds uh, prior to establishment with a, um, uh, the use of a pre-emergent herbicide in a uh, lawn and landscape. Uh, pre-emergent herbicides typically do not uh, inhibit uh, the root growth of well-established turf grasses. Uh, usually, uh, turf grasses that are mature have a deep and healthy root system that uh, penetrate below the uh, layer or where the presence of that pre-emergent herbicide is in the soil. So uh, a, a, a lawn that has a uh, three to four inch uh, root depth on it uh, typically will not be affected by pre-emergent herbicides concentrated in the upper half inch of the soil profile. Where we run into trouble with uh, pre-emergent herbicides and turf grass rooting is when uh, we have winter kill, when we have um, thinned out grass, when we have disease, uh, and that grass is trying to re-root into treated areas. When it's spreading a lateral stem or a stolen, and it's trying to tack down a new root uh, on that lateral stem, uh, that's where we see the greatest potential to inhibit uh, turf grass rooting is when it's trying to uh, produce a uh, new root on a lateral stem. Um, when it's trying to peg down in a uh, bare ground situation. But generally speaking, well-established lawns, uh, there's limited to no risk uh, on the uh, health of the root system using pre-emergent herbicides at appropriate labeled use rates. We have a wide variety of uh, pre-emergent herbicides that are available to turf grass managers. They are sold under a wide variety of trade names, and uh, they can also be found in various formulations, either sprayable or spreadable formulations. Uh, some of these can be impregnated on a fertilizer with a weed and feed um, type of application. So uh, some of these herbicides like prodiamine and pendimethalin, uh, these are widely used for pre-emergent crabgrass control in the late winter time and in the spring. We can also use these herbicides in late summer and fall uh, to prevent the establishment of annual grassy weeds. Uh, so we can control annual bluegrass uh, with a timely application of those herbicides as well in the fall. Uh, however, pre-emergent herbicides generally do not provide acceptable levels of post-emergent weed control. So once the weed has established, uh, these products generally are not effective for controlling established weeds uh, present in our turf. There are some active ingredients uh, like isoxaban or gallery, uh, which is uh, very strong on broadleaf weeds specifically, but a little bit weaker on grassy weeds uh, versus uh, some products uh, like prodiamine, which is very strong on grassy weeds, but can be weak on broadleaf weeds. So uh, these all have uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, depending on the uh, weed, uh, the weeds that you're targeting uh, with that application. We are using pre-emergent herbicides to control uh, summer and winter annual weeds only. Uh, again, these are weeds that establish from seed and pre-emergent herbicides are most effective for controlling weeds that are uh, germinating from seed only. We are not targeting perennial weeds with uh, pre-emergent herbicides. We are also not targeting weeds that are currently present in our turf, generally speaking, with most uh, pre-emergent herbicides because they are not effective once the plant has been established uh, and is uh, healthy and actively growing. Uh, one of the concerns that we have is we have to get pre-emergent herbicides activated. Uh, we need to irrigate behind these treatments to uh, get them uh, off of the uh, shoots of turf grass and get them activated in the soil so that they will be available for absorption uh, by weed seedlings. So uh, one of the concerns is that if you cannot irrigate um, and you don't have timely rainfall, 
Uh, going out with a sprayable formulation uh, could lead to potential failures uh, because it's not getting into the soil and it's not getting activated as readily as, say, a dry granule formulation. Uh, we can have herbicide losses with a sprayable formulation where it fails to get to the soil, either through uh, photodegradation or breakdown by sunlight, volatilization where it's lost through a gas form, and then of course clipping collection and traffic if we actually physically remove that uh, herbicide from the area, uh, of course it's not going to be in high enough concentration to provide effective weed control when the product gets into the soil. Uh, dry granular formulations, uh, spreadable products are much better if you uh, do not have irrigation or we're in a drought situation. These uh, products can get to the soil uh, much better uh, and they are not moved uh, and there's much, much less potential for losses using a granular product compared to a sprayable product if you cannot water behind the treatments. Typically, uh, we are looking at uh, pre-emergent herbicide applications in March in most parts of the state of Georgia. Uh, the application timing is going to depend on soil temperatures. So uh, in the springtime, we typically get our pre-emergent herbicide applications out when uh, soil temperatures reach the uh, low 50s in the upper uh, uh, two inches of the soil profile. Uh, and this is going to vary based on where you are in the state. So obviously the southern part of Georgia is going to warm up uh, much earlier than the central and northern part of the state. And uh, these dates are just uh, general guidelines for um, when we should be targeting uh, getting those applications out for pre-emergent weed control. A, a very good uh, website to uh, track local soil temperatures, air temperatures, and Growing degree days is georgiaweather.net. Georgiaweather.net uh, has uh, many different weather stations scattered throughout the state, and uh, it is a very good resource to get uh, local soil temperatures to uh, help time management inputs, such as um, pre emergent herbicide applications in the spring and the fall. So, georgiaweather.net, uh, you can go in, uh, type in your location and uh, it will give you the uh, closest uh, weather station uh, to your area and a great way to uh, track local growing conditions so that you can more effectively time uh, uh, pre-emergent herbicides in the spring. Pre-emergent herbicides used in turf grass all have different uh, lengths of residual activity. Some of these herbicides are going to last longer in the soil at labeled use rates compared to um, uh, products that have a moderate or short activity, such as products like Sigeron, 2%, Pendimethylin, Dithiopyr. Uh, these typically are going to last uh, you know, a few months in the soil based on uh, labeled use rate. Products like prodiamine, oxidiazon at uh, labeled rates are going to last four to six months depending on the uh, conditions, soil temperatures, and uh, factors that are going to influence the uh, residual effects of a herbicide and the degradation of the herbicide in the soil. Uh, but something to have an appreciation for is that there are pre-emergent herbicides that you can use that will uh, provide four to six weeks of residual weed control. And that may be all you need if you need to come in and seed or sod in a treated area. Uh, is the, uh, there are some products that will not last quite as long. Uh, and then there may be uh, cases such as in lawn care where you want the longest control possible. So going with a prodiamine uh, treatment may be more appropriate there where you're trying to extend the length of residual control uh, throughout the growing season. Winter annual weeds, we typically target uh, getting pre-emergent herbicides out in September in most areas in the state. Uh, South Georgia, typically we start looking at pre-emergent herbicide applications uh, around the first week of October. This is when soil temperatures start to uh, dip uh, below 70 degrees. So as we cool down, winter annual weeds begin germination and uh, we need to get our pre-emergent herbicides out before those weeds start to emerge. Uh, weeds like annual bluegrass, henbit, uh, we can see them uh, germinate in mid-September, late September, uh, depending on where you are in the state. 
so this is just a general uh, reference and a guideline to uh, uh, get fall pre-emergent herbicides out at uh, you know, various locations in the state. One of the ways that we can extend the length of pre-emergent weed control is to apply split applications of a pre-emergent herbicide. So instead of putting out all the product at once, uh, we can uh, make multiple applications uh, at a six to eight week interval. A uh, good example here is uh, instead of applying uh, barricade or prodiamine to one pound active ingredient per acre, splitting that application into half a pound active uh, applied in March, and come back around late May or June with another half pound active per acre uh, has shown to uh, extend residual control greater than just putting out all the product at once. Uh, we are able to get better control of the uh, late season flushes of crabgrass and other annual weeds by just splitting that application and uh, going with a split program. Uh, helps uh, provide a fresh supply of that herbicide to the soil and uh, can extend the length of control compared to just a single treatment uh, of that uh, uh, total application rate all with one um, shot. Pre-emergent herbicides that we can use this time of year for controlling uh, winter annual weeds such as Poa annua. Uh, there are many different products on the market. Many of the herbicides that control uh, crabgrass and goosegrass also can provide pre-emergent control of weeds like annual bluegrass. Uh, so, you know, uh, crabgrass halts uh, preventer, uh, crabgrass preventer herbicide can also be used in the fall to control uh, weeds like annual bluegrass. Uh, so we, uh, products like prodiamine, pentamethalin. One of the most popular herbicides now in lawn care in Georgia uh, and in golf course turf, uh, in, in parks as well, is Spectacle. Uh, this active ingredient in Dazaflam is uh, very good, very active on POA annua, uh, and it also provides a different mode of action to the dinitroanilins that we are using for uh, uh, controlling uh, crabgrass and other weeds uh, uh, with that uh, uh, a different mode of action. Some of the concerns that we have right now, especially with annual bluegrass, is herbicide resistance. Uh, we are seeing pictures like this where turf managers are, are telling us that control is just not what it used to be uh, using the same product year after year. And typically what we're seeing with weeds like annual bluegrass that have received uh, the same herbicide in an area for multiple years is segregation in the population. We are seeing a shift where uh, we are seeing resistant biotypes emerging that are not responding uh, to a herbicide uh, that may have been uh, used exclusively for a certain period of time. And uh, this resistance issue is increasing with annual bluegrass, goosegrass, and other weeds in turf grass. And uh, something to uh, you know, have an appreciation for is that if you use the same product or the same herbicide mode of action year over year, uh, you can cause a shift in the weed population. We are seeing this right now, uh, you know, especially with annual bluegrass and turf grass throughout the state of Georgia, where we're seeing resistance issues uh, that are increasing in lawns, golf courses, sod farms, and uh, you know, various turf grass areas. Herbicide resistance occurs at, through selection pressure. Uh, this graph shows in year one where all the green plants uh, present are controlled by a certain herbicide. Uh, however, that one plant in orange survives uh, that treatment. It is a naturally resistant biotype that does not respond uh, to that specific herbicide. That one plant in year one could be one in a thousand, it could be one in a million. But over time, uh, with selection pressure, using the same herbicide over and over, that one plant will spread, it will go to seed, and over time, year two, year three, four, and five, we are shifting that population, and we are giving the opportunity of that resistant biotype to spread, reproduce, and um, it is not being controlled by the use of the same product over and over. And then by year five, you've got a very serious problem where uh, you are now dealing with a weed population that is resistant 
uh, to that specific herbicide. And uh, this is something that we are finding in turf grass throughout the state. Uh, we're seeing more and more weeds with this issue uh, that are not responding to a pre or post immersion herbicide. Typically what is happening here is uh, resistant weeds have an altered target site uh, where the herbicide simply just does not bind uh, the way it normally does to a susceptible population. So uh, the target site where that herbicide normally binds on the right of this slide, uh, that herbicide is obviously not going to bind properly uh, and therefore it is not controlled. Uh, and this is the most common form of herbicide resistance in a weed. It, uh, it is a naturally occurring um, uh, trait in that specific biotype. So we are not causing a change in the plant by using a herbicide, but what we are doing is selecting for biotypes that have that mutation present uh, that prevents that herbicide from binding properly to get effective control. This is a big problem right now for us in Georgia with Poa annua. Um, annual bluegrass is one of the most difficult weeds to control, probably the most troublesome weed for us in uh, turf grass, especially in the winter time. We are seeing widespread resistance to dinitroaniline pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, this includes uh, some of the active ingredients like pendimethalin and prodiamine. Uh, some of the other herbicides that uh, are group three uh, mitotic inhibitors include products like Dimension. Uh, this is widely used for crabgrass, uh, but it has a similar mode of action to the dinitroanalyst. And what we're seeing in Georgia is that uh, uh, poa annual populations that are resistant to pendimethalin and prodiamine are also cross-resistant to dimension as well. So uh, that is a concern because these are very popular pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, here's a look at uh, barricade-resistant POA and some of our uh, field research where we went out with barricade at the uh, standard timing. Uh, this is prodiamine, and you can see we're getting uh, very significant failures in control uh, with that uh, pre-emergent treatment of barricade there, where it just looks like we sprayed water. There's just no response at all. Uh, what we are doing is uh, testing plants to uh, confirm resistance in the field. Uh, so what, what we are doing is growing these plants out hydroponically and exposing them to various concentrations of a pre-emergent herbicide. And uh, what we're typically doing is coming in and cutting the roots off the plants and then sticking, sticking them in the uh, tanks that uh, have hydroponic uh, 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 solutions with or without the uh, pre-emergent herbicide present. And if a weed is resistant to dinitroaniline herbicides like prodiamine, it will grow a nice healthy root system in the presence of that herbicide in the hydroponic tank. And uh, this is what we're seeing where weeds are growing right through pre-emergent herbicides like prodiamine. We're growing a nice healthy root system there versus the susceptible biotypes on the right uh, that are completely uh, controlled uh, by, by that treatment. Uh, which uh, is showing very susceptible root systems there uh, growing in the presence of that pre-emergent herbicide. Fall is a great time of year also to come out with uh, post-emergent herbicides to control annual bluegrass. Uh, that is when uh, winter annual weeds, uh, poa, henbit, hop clovers, uh, that's typically when uh, we get the best control is when these plants are at the seedling stage, they are most susceptible, and certain products like Katana, Monument, some of the sulfonylureas uh, can provide uh, very good uh, post-emergent control early in the fall, uh, and then it has enough residual to get through peak uh, winter annual weed germination periods. Here's a look at Katana, which is applied in the fall, uh, and this picture was taken in March, and you can just see the pressure of the annual bluegrass that sort of surrounds that plot there. So this can be a very good treatment to control seedling winter weeds uh, at that fall timing. Typically getting these treatments out around mid-November, sometime around Thanksgiving or so, uh, can uh, get very good post-emergent control of the seedling weeds and uh, get you through that peak germination period uh, that will hold throughout the season. However, again, we are seeing sulfonylurea resistance like this, uh, where we come in and we're getting just segregation. You come in, you get 
complete control of some plants and other plants are growing right through those treatments. And this is a widespread problem now in turf grass throughout the southeast, specifically with sulfonylurea herbicides, um, triazine herbicides, and the dinitroaniline pre-emergent herbicides as well. Um, what we're seeing is sort of classic target site resistance uh, with sulfonylurea herbicides uh, with annual bluegrass. Uh, here's a look at a resistant biotype that we tested in the greenhouse on the top versus the local griffin biotype on the bottom there, susceptible population to monument. And you can see where we started these uh, rate titrations uh, with the uh, resistant biotype, the standard labeled use rate is half an ounce of product per acre. We went, went up to about a 300X rate and there was simply just no response. Uh, there from the plant. So this is a classic target site resistance where no matter how much herbicide you apply to the plant, because there's an altered mutated target site, it is just not going to bind properly and there's no response uh, from the plant. Uh, so what we did was uh, looked at uh, some resistance management programs for controlling annual bluegrass last fall. Uh, these were done on three different golf courses that had expressed uh, concerns over herbicide resistance issues. And I think this kind of tells a nice story to uh, show some of the uh, plans and programs that you could uh, use in warm season grasses uh, to combat herbicide resistant POA uh, this fall and uh, winter in your turf. Uh, at, at these three golf courses, we applied barricade of the standard pre-emergent timing. At golf course one and two, we saw that we had resistance problems. Uh, where we were not getting good control at golf course three. Uh, we had susceptible POA, so we had actually very good control at that third golf course. However, when we switched from barricade to a different mode of action, which is spectacle, uh, we got uh, basically uh, good to excellent control at all three locations. So rotating modes of action, rotating chemistries uh, from a dinitroaniline to a different uh, chemistry uh, spectacle, uh, was a uh, great uh, tool to uh, get that uh, DNA resistant POA control at golf course one and two. We also found simazine resistance at uh, golf course one and three. However, golf course two uh, did have simazine susceptible uh, POA annua. Uh, we also tested revolver, which is a uh, sulfonylurea herbicide. At golf course one and three, we had susceptible POA to that mode of action. However, at golf course two, where simazine was working, we had resistance issues there uh, using revolver. And uh, what we found was that um, when we came in with a combination of the revolver with simazine, having those two modes of action uh, gave us complete control of POA at all the golf courses that we tested. So uh, really the uh, uh, you know, take home message here is that rotating modes of action can be important but for post-emergent POA control in Georgia, especially in Bermuda grass and zoysia grass turf, uh, coming in with two modes of action, combining a sulfonylurea herbicide with a triazine herbicide, uh, two different chemistries that offer different modes of action, uh, can help control uh, biotypes with suspected resistance issues to one uh, of those modes of action. So the, the, the combination uh, this is a fairly cost-effective uh, way to uh, help combat resistance issues uh, and help prevent the spread of biotypes with herbicide resistance as well. So for uh, controlling POA annua in centipede grass, uh, mid-November, early December timings of katana, which is a sulfonylurea herbicide, can work very well with simazine. Uh, we can also use rim sulfuron, which is transit in non-residential areas uh, with simazine at a quart per acre. And having that simazine in there is a, uh, a nice uh, kicker to using sulfonylureas. It is about a $5 per acre treatment and uh, can provide a second mode of action in the mix with a sulfonylurea to help combat resistance. Curb can also be used in non-residential turf grass at that um, Late November timing, uh, one and a half pounds active ingredient per acre can also uh, help control uh, POA annua at that timing, and it provides a different mode of action than most other post-emergent herbicides used in turf grass. 
And then pre-emergent control, obviously, uh, in September, the uh, first week of October, depending on where you are in the state, dinitroanilins, uh, rotating the spectacle if possible in uh, lawns and landscapes is a, a very good program to uh, prevent the establishment of uh, POA and turf. Uh, here's a look at centipede grass that was treated with the tank mixtures, and you can see using cinnazine uh, with katana, uh, using it with rim sulfuron can is, it has shown to be safe at that application timing in, in late fall. So as the grass is slowing down, uh, we, we can use those combinations safely as long as the centipede is healthy uh, and is uh, not uh, growing under pressure from disease or other stresses, uh, those uh, tape mixture combinations can be very effective for uh, controlling POA and can be safe uh, in that species. For controlling POA in Bermuda grass and zoysia grass, again, sulfonylurea herbicides applied with simazine uh, is a, a great program. We've got a lot more sulfonylureas that are safe uh, for use in these two turf species, uh, products like Revolver, Monument, Katana, uh, Tribute Total, those are all uh, sulfonylurea, ALS inhibiting herbicides. But having that second mode of action in there with simazine uh, can make a big difference uh, whether or not you're successful for controlling POA. Curb also, again, non-residential sites, one and a half pounds, active ingredient per acre, and then pre-emergent control if possible uh, in the fall uh, is going to set you up for success for controlling POA. Uh, in those lawns. We're also seeing resistance issues now with uh, sedges. Uh, this is a look at Cyperus compressus annual sedge, which is a, a true summer annual goes to seed. We are seeing problems uh, with uh, multiple populations found throughout the state of hollow sulfur arm resistant sedge, and it's also cross resistant to other sulfonylureas. So Rotating modes of action there, coming in with sulfentrazone or dismissed. Having Vasegrin as, as a tank mix partner can also uh, help combat resistance issues with ALS resistant sedges uh, that we're seeing in the state. Where there is also other uh, sedge species that have confirmed resistance to post-emergent applications of sulfonylureas, products like Halo Sulfuron or Sedge Hammer. Uh, we have seen resistance with yellow nut sedge and uh, various other sedge species that we can also find in uh, turf grass. And these have been reported in various cropping systems throughout the Southeast. Ways to combat resistance with sedges, again, uh, using Dismiss, which is a different mode of action, sulfentrazone, 10 to 12 ounces of product per acre uh, in a tank mixture with sulfonylureas uh, can help control resistant biotypes and help delay the spread of resistance in sedge populations. Vasegrin can also be used. Uh, and we do have some pre-emergent herbicides that will control certain sedge species. Uh, products like Ronstar in uh, non-residential turf. Uh, products like Echelon and Dismiss that contain sulfentrazone. Going out in uh, late springtime with those treatments uh, can provide pre-emergent uh, control of sedges, uh, such as annual sedge, yellow nut sedge, and uh, certain Kalinga species as well. And then we do have other uh, pre-emergent herbicides that are labeled in warm season turf grasses like pennant, tower, and freehand that also have very good activity for uh, pre-emergent control of uh, sedge species. Other herbicide resistant weeds that we have found in turf include uh, goosegrass, which has, uh, we found multiple populations with resistance to uh, pre and post-emergent herbicides that, we, that are popular in turf grass. Spotted spurge, ryegrass, plantain, uh, southern crabgrass. So th this is an issue that will continue uh, to um, uh, be a problem for us in turf grass. Something that turf managers need to have an appreciation for is how weeds develop resistance uh, to herbicides and what we can do to be proactive in preventing uh, resistance from uh, becoming a long-term problem. And uh, sometimes we don't have alternative herbicide chemistries that are safe and selective for controlling resistant biotypes, and uh, that creates great concern for us. But uh, we are, are now seeing more and more weed species with resistance issues. Uh, and so, it's just something that you need to have an appreciation for, uh, you know, especially for weeds like Poa annua, where it is just so difficult to control now 
we need to have multiple uh, programs and rotation of herbicides and the modes of action that are going out in uh, weed control programs. All right, new herbicides that are coming out here uh, in 2018. Um, the first one is a new active ingredient from Dow called haloxifen. Uh, this is a synthetic auxin herbicide, group four broadleaf weed uh, uh, product uh, that provides post-emergent control of annual and perennial broadleaf weeds. It has very fast activity. Haloxifen is a fast active ingredient. We typically see the response in uh, susceptible broadleaf weeds within about five to seven days. Uh, very rapid uh, browning and necrosis of the, uh, 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 of the tissue on the plant. Uh, it has favorable characteristics for turf grass and also sod production where it has rapid degradation. Uh, there's no composting issues, so it has uh, favorable characteristics for us in uh, lawns and landscapes. Uh, the first product that's going to be released from Dow uh, that contains haloxifen is going to be called Relzar. This is a combination with uh, a uh, broadleaf herbicide with a different mode of action, Fluragilam, uh, which is uh, found in the uh, product Defender. Uh, this will be released as a WG formulation in the second quarter of uh, 2018. It's going to be used in all major warm and cool season turf grasses for post-emergent broadleaf weed control. And uh, they're going to keep it simple. It's going to have one uh, labeled use rate, which is 0 .72, uh, uh, 0.72 ounces of product per acre. And that's going to be the standard use rate for all uh, labeled turf grass species. And uh, this will be a good tool, I think, for us in Georgia because it's going to include uh, centipede, Bermuda, zoysia grass, uh, fescue. So if you're managing lawns uh, with mixed species or if you uh, need to make up a tank and spray multiple uh, lawns of various turf species, uh, this product will have a nice fit uh, for that use. Uh, again, this product has very rapid activity. This is uh, four weeks after treatments for controlling common chickweed in the wintertime where many broadleaf weed uh, products are slow with cold temperatures uh, there in the winter. Uh, very rapid knockdown control with Relzar um, applied in the winter for controlling common chickweed. Uh, very active on uh, broadleaf weeds as well uh, in the summertime, uh, weeds like buttonweed, uh, matchweed here in St. Augustine grass, and um, it uh, should have a, uh, a good fit for uh, uh, use in the summertime for uh, controlling weeds like dubweed. Um, some activity on common lespedeza, but it's not going to be a standalone product. Uh, but th there's going to be some weeds like plantain and dandelion, which can provide very rapid knockdown control uh, with a single uh, treatment. Game On is another uh, new product from Dow that's going to contain haloxifen. This is a three way combination with 2,4 D choline and fluoroxapure. It will also be released in 2018. They're going to primarily target game on for using cool season grasses. Uh, most warm season species like uh, centipede and St. Augustine are going to have sensitivity issues to 2,4-D. So it's going to be a cool season grass, all fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, ryegrass product. Uh, we can use it in Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. And uh, this product provides a uh, very uh, rapid knockdown control of uh, perennial broadleaf weeds, and I think it's going to be a, a, a strong uh, new combination product for us in uh, turf grass. Here's a look at dandelion four days after treatments with game on. Very rapid necrosis, discoloration there of the uh, uh, plant, and we see broadleaf weeds like dandelion and plantain twist up within about seven days, so very rapid uh, control of susceptible broadleaf weeds uh, to these active ingredients. There can be some Bermuda grass injury from game on, uh, which can last uh, two weeks or so at labeled use rates. So there uh, can be some off coloring, especially during spring transition. But uh, this uh, treatment will probably have a, a good fit for uh, midsummer applications after Bermuda grass uh, has resumed active growth. It's, it's greened up and it's healthy. Uh, should have good tolerance uh, to those treatments. Relzar and Game On have shown uh, very good activity for controlling dove weed. 
uh, which is a very problematic weed for us in Georgia right now. Uh, you can see here the percent cover with Relzar on the left and the game on uh, there in the middle uh, compared to Celsius, very uh, comparable levels of activity to Celsius and um, uh, therefore controlling dove weed in the summertime. And you can see what the non treat is doing on the far right where the population is going to increase over time. So uh, new tools in the toolbox for controlling problem weeds, especially dove weed, which I think is going to be one of the most uh, promising uses of these new products coming out from Dow here uh, next year. The uh, next new product that uh, contains haloxifen that's going to be released in late 2018 is called Switchblade. This is a three-way combination product uh, similar to Game On, except they replaced the 2,4-D choline with dicamba. So uh, it's going to contain the new active ingredient, haloxifen, uh, that has a rapid knockdown control, dicamba, and peroxipure. Uh, this will be labeled in uh, most major warm season turf grasses, including centipede grass uh, and uh, cool season grasses. Um, it will also have a St. Augustine grass uh, use on the label as well. Uh, and again, uh, very good three-way combination for controlling many uh, troublesome perennial broadleaf weeds and turf grass. The next new active ingredient that's going to be released in 2018 in turf grass is called pyrimisulfan. Uh, this is going to be a, a combination product with panoxalum uh, uh, and sold as a trade name Vexus. Uh, this will be released again in 2018. This product is a combination of two ALS inhibiting herbicides. So the same mode of action as sulfonylureas, uh, and it will come out as a granular product. So it's gonna be a spreadable uh, uh, product, likely gonna have a fertilizer carrier on it. Uh, the potential uses is gonna be for warm season grasses. Uh, this combination product, Vexus, will control broadleaf weeds. It does have good activity on many sedges as well. Um, but it's weak on crabgrass and goosegrass and some of the grassy weeds that we have in the summertime. But uh, the advantage of using Vexus is going to be the root uptake. Uh, you don't have to have dew on the plant for it to stick and, and provide control. So you can go out on dry turf, spread it, and uh, both of these active ingredients have significant root uptake. Uh, and uh, you can still get very good weed control uh, with this product. Uh, without due present. Uh, here's a look at some of our plots uh, where we researched Vexus over the years uh, with the fertilizer carrier. We have seen very good control of uh, winter annual broadleaf weeds in our plots. Uh, weeds like uh, parsley perk, uh, cudweed, uh, some of those types of weeds that are starting to emerge right now. Vexus has very good activity on those species. And then of course the fertilizer can give a little greening effect, um, you know, following those treatments. Uh, we have seen uh, some erratic levels for controlling annual bluegrass. Uh, so I don't think this is gonna be a very good POA herbicide, uh, but the strength is gonna be primarily broadleaf weeds in, uh, in uh, warm season turf grasses, especially winter annual weeds with those fall treatments. Uh, here's a look at prodiamine in, in those plots where we got very good polo control, but uh, basically released lawn burrweed. Uh, we've seen that barricade and prodiamine. When we select for annual grassy weeds, we can actually enhance the establishment of some of the weeds that are not susceptible to that mode of action. And uh, lawn burrweed, as you can see in those plots, is not controlled by uh, barricade applications. So using a product like Barricade with Vexus or you know, a different broadleaf herbicide uh, is gonna be important if you're targeting both grassy and broadleaf weeds uh, in the fall. One of the advantages with uh, Vexus is that it has very good activity for controlling sedges. Here's just a look at some of our research in the greenhouse where we looked at uh, the control of biotypes that are susceptible and resistant to sulfonylurea herbicides. And Vexus is there on the right uh, with, its, with its experimental code number there. Uh, very good activity on susceptible biotype to sulfonylureas. It also has some activity for controlling resistant biotypes there on the right. Uh, you can see the activity on the ALS resistant sedge, 
uh, and this uh, product is uh, showing good activity for uh, partial suppression. And I think multiple applications may have a nice fit uh, with other chemistries for controlling uh, and, uh, the, the sedge populations with uh, resistance issue to sulfonylureas. Although this is the same mode of action as the sulfonylureas, Vexus has a, a, uh, one of the active ingredients from a different chemical family and that difference in the binding is uh, giving partial control of resistant biotypes to sulfonylurea herbicides. So another uh, tool in the toolbox, I guess, for managing resistant uh, weeds in uh, turf grass. The uh, next new product is um, a trade name called Solero. Uh, the active ingredient is a mazasulfuron. This is a product uh, being sold by New Farm that was released about a year or two ago. Uh, this was developed by Valent over the years. It's now sold by New Farm. It uh, is labeled for all major warm and cool uh, season turf grasses. Uh, it controls annual uh, and perennial sedges, uh, comparable levels of control to monument and certainty for controlling perennial sedges and Kalinga. Uh, it also does have some activity for controlling broadleaf weeds. So uh, just something to have an appreciation for. Solero is out there. It uh, has comparable uh, levels of use or uh, use patterns as sedge hammer, hallow sulfuron for use in both warm and cool season turf grasses. It has very good activity for controlling many different sedge species in turf. Dismiss NXT is another uh, new product uh, that was released in the turf grass industry this year. Uh, this was uh, brought to the market by FMC uh, in their line of sulfentrazone products. Uh, this is a combination of sulfentrazone, which is the active ingredient in Dismiss, with carfentrazone, which is the active ingredient in Quicksilver. And the benefits of using carfentrazone in the mix with this product is the speed of control. Uh, we are getting uh, much, uh, we are getting rapid control of sedges. Uh, Kalinga with Dismiss NXT. Uh, it's labeled for most major warm and cool season turf grasses. Uh, and we are using Dismiss NXT uh, on the same spectrum of weeds that we use Dismiss for. So the sedges and Kalinga, certain broadleaf weeds as well, uh, does have some activity on goosegrass. But Dismiss NXT uh, provides rapid control of Kalinga seven days after treatments like you see there. Very uh, uh, fast takedown and, and uh, response of uh, those types of weeds. However, um, we are not seeing a significant difference in uh, the levels of control, uh, long-term control with Dismiss NXT compared to straight Dismiss. So the speed of control with Dismiss NXT, I think is uh, the major advantage here, but uh, in terms of uh, it being better than Dismiss, we just uh, do not have data to support that claim. But uh, still a good product, rapid control, and uh, sometimes getting that uh, response from the weeds uh, can make your clients happy, can make homeowners happy, and uh, that uh, rapid activity is certainly nice to see after you make those applications. And finally, we are testing a uh, new three-way combination product that should be released next year from a company called SIPCAM. Uh, this is a uh, three-way combination product for a, a uh, simazine, amazepine, and prodiamine. Um, product called Coastal. Uh, this is going to be simazine and amazequin, which is going to have uh, post-emergent activity for controlling broadleaf weeds and sedges. They will also control uh, POA annua. Uh, so having two chemistries in there for post-emergent POA control is nice. It has two different modes of action. And then prodiamine, which is uh, barricade uh, for the residual pre-emergent control of uh, uh, weeds in there as well. So it's a pre-emergent plus post-emergent uh, treatment. We have seen uh, very good uh, control of winter annual weeds like clover, uh, poa annua, uh, and uh, various other winter annual broadleaf weeds in our test plots, as you can see here from Coastal. And uh, with the prodiamine in the mix, uh, with those spring treatments, we can get very good crabgrass control as well throughout the year. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of these combination products that are combining multiple uh, chemistries that provide both pre and post-emergent weed control, different modes of action as well there uh, to combat resistant weeds 
and uh, Coastal is going to be the first of uh, many of these types of combinations that will be uh, coming out for the turf grass industry. So with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attendance and uh, hope to uh, see you guys sometime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.